Today I'm with a real life food inspector and I'm gonna answer all your questions. Hello, I'm Griffiths, welcome to Winnie Griffith. Here we talk everything beekeeping, farming, countryside living, and we do reviews as well. Now I've got Ian, he's the food inspector for Carmarthenshire County Council. Welcome to the channel, Ian. Nice and, you again, Griff. and thanks uh, for, to agreeing to do this. We've got a, a lot of questions, especially with new beekeepers starting, that they're not quite sure of, you know, and I get asked all these questions, you know, is this okay, Griff? And I'm thinking, well, I don't really know, so I've got the expert in you, and I've got a list of questions here we're going to ask Ian and he's going to answer these as best as you can and hopefully uh, this will make it things a lot easier at you at home. Now I will say being a farmer that there's only two people farmers are scared of and that's the VAT man and any inspector. So this guy every farmer is scared of food inspectors. I'm only, I'm only joking Ian I but um, yeah let's oh, get you go, you go. yeah let's get let's get into the questions. What do you do? What's the purpose of the food inspector role when it comes to, say, food, but mainly looking at honey? You know, what, what's your job when it comes to the beekeeper? Two bits, really, is to ensure food safety, to make sure the public get a safe food product that's placed on the market. And, ostensibly, we also wear a hat to make sure things are fair between you and another trader that's trading in a similar product. So there's an element of economic fair trade and there's an element of food safety. At what stage of someone's beekeeping journey do they need to get hold of you? Does someone does someone start a beekeeping and once they start selling honey from the house or you know from the farm gate, do they need to get the food inspector involved or once they get into shops and they, they, they grow their business, is that the stage where It's a very good question, Griff and a lot of people do register with us eventually when they've been up and running hundreds of years. And I would say at any point in that journey, they can approach us for advice. It doesn't mean to say we're going to inspect them or they need to be food registered. Not every honey producer is a food business. That's a myth. And not everyone that we help do we register. Um, for those that sell to businesses that place it on the market business to business, we would normally get involved in the composition and the labelling. And for certain food honey producers we do register them as a food food producer because their production isn't at the same site as their hives so that normally when they're quite substantially large like yourself <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah we've had a fair few inspections over, over the years but like i said that is a good thing and that's there to make sure that the honey that's on the market is a good product and it's safe for people to eat and the, the label and everything's uh, legal isn't it yeah and that we're all playing on the same rules. But if a new beginner wants some advice, just generally on setting up their kitchen or labelling, we're more than happy to advise. It's not, it's not an inspection, it's just advice. Yeah. It's free. <laughs> and, and that's one thing I want to get across in this video is, people are scared of the food inspectors, they're scared of any inspector really, but really, your role is to educate people uh, you've obviously helped me out a lot here with, with my business. You know, Ian's adv advised me over the years on, on, on things that I've got to do. And we, we're building a new honey house this year. And I've asked you kindly, can you come in as we're building that to make sure we, we're building it right? So you are there for advice and to make sure when, when someone does invest money, that they're invested it correctly and they're not going to waste any That's money it. doing it yeah. wrong. Yeah, we're, we're here to help and we're here to make sure things are fair and even. Yeah, for sure. So if a beekeeper wants to contact someone like you, how do they contact the food inspectors? It is quite tricky these days because we are obviously out and about an awful lot. So the easiest way is to go on the website. I'm afraid if you haven't got the internet, it doesn't make it tricky. But we do have a business support team. You can telephone up just the council general customer services line. You can register your business online or you can just put a query online. It will get through to us eventually. It gets allocated by officer by area. So it's not always... If it's a B issue, it will come to me. It's whether it's in my postcode area. I get you. To me. So certain industries are exclusively, depending on the complexity and the, uh, the level of complication, certain officers look after. So obviously uh, approved food premises tend to be certain staff do them. But generally, any inspector would be able to do a primary producer like a honeykeeper in their area. So if you register and you feel like you need an inspection, then just get in touch with the council either by telephone or by the internet. 
for sure. Perfect, easy, easy to do. Now here's a big question I get asked all the time. Are people allowed to extract honey in, a, in the kitchen of their house and then sell that honey? For sure, and a lot of food businesses that make jam or produce, I don't know, duck fat do it at home. They don't have a registered industrial estate food style premise that uh, you'd associate with um, businesses. No, they do it at home and their home becomes their premise. All that happens is we turn it from a domestic premise into a registered food premise for the purposes of that activity. And it could be that they're doing chutneys, honey, making homemade cakes. They could be doing loads of different activities. But yeah, honey is quite popularly done at home, in the kitchen, in your domestic environment. And we just have to hopefully make sure that the domestic environment is safe to do that in. Well, that, that leads me to the next question. So I've got a few questions of people who people have asked. What happens if they've got a, a pet in the house that live in the same house and maybe the pet lives in the kitchen? Are they allowed to deep clean the kitchen, move the dog outside for the day, extract the honey and then the dog can come back in? Is, is that a no? Yeah, for sure. That is generally what happens is particularly during the inspection, they'll shut the dogs up, they'll put their cat in the bedroom to make sure they're not wandering in during the visit. The kitchen at that point becomes a food premise and at that point they decide to extract or take the honey out of their foundation. At that point they need to make sure that environment is safe. So yeah, excluding your animals or your husband that comes in with his dirty clothes on, you've got to have some rules and boundaries mm -hmm. and that includes your family pets. At other times it's free to use as a domestic kitchen again which is fine. But the day that you want to extract, no, we need to put in some boundary rules and no pets. And it's easy to clean the kitchen before and afterwards. It's just recognising that pets can be obviously a source of cross-contamination. Of course. Well, I'm pretty sure a lot of you watching this is going to be seriously relieved uh, at your answer there. Because, you know, people see my honey house, they see other beef farm honey house and thinking, try, I've got to sp sp you know, invest tens of thousands of pounds to, you know, maybe sell a hundred kilos of honey a year. Well, it turns out you don't and you've heard it from the horse's mouth, like they say. So uh, a lot of beekeepers, especially when they start off, are going to be mm. uh, very, very pleased with that answer. And I suppose the third part of that question is... At what stage is the kitchen too small? Is it set out at you know the yeah. amount of hives or how much you produce? So is it becoming you know once it's more of a weekend job extracting the honey, then you need to start thinking of maybe getting I mean, better premises? Absolutely, and I think people realise it themselves because I go to a lot of domestic producers and they've built their own dedicated unit on the side of the house because they've recognised that the kitchen just is not the best location to do the extraction. It's messy, it creates a lot of sticky surfaces and sometimes your kitchen isn't the best place and starting again from scratch in a new purpose-built room is the best way forward. And as you've done, you realise that you don't design it like your kitchen. You no, yeah. Completely differently. So, yeah, your kitchen is a good start. And by all means, it's not the world's worst place we see when we come to food premises. But it will rapidly outgrow someone's capacity. The more hives they have to extract, the more foundation they have to kind of cut. And the more jars they have to pack. And the, the, the longer that task takes, the longer your kitchen is going to be tied up, not be in a domestic kitchen mm. so yeah why not have a dedicated room yeah well there we go starting off that's what i did i extracted in the kitchen for years when we were small scale and then when that became a big job and you know we were extracting over several days uh you know we we looked to invest in in a, in a proper room so but you know for you guys starting at home starting off the kitchen as long as it's clean it's fine and you don't have to worry too much about your cat dog you know you've literally got to move them out clean everything down and then get on with the honey you've got to as you're doing the job, you've got, you've got to treat the room a bit different then. Yeah, for Perfect. Sure. So someone has invested in a new honey house or they, they're selling to a lot of shops. They want to do some markets. The, the guys leading the market has gone, right, to do this show, we've got to have a food hygiene level. So they, they approach you, Ian, I need to get, you know, five stars on the door, etc. How easy is it to get in regards to producing and selling honey? Good question. I mean, from the minute someone registers us with us, we've got 28 days to inspect them. So I'd expect that person to have done their homework on what is required as a food premise. So the Food Standards Agency have a very good guide. We would send them an introductory email with things that they can do, go on a training course, get themselves food trained, 
consider if they need to have a food safety management system, what that may look like. Try and put into paper some of the things they're going to do anyway, like cleaning, pest control, that type of activity. And think about what it is that may be hazardous in their process. So when we turn up and we assess them, not only their structure is good, but their actual operational hygiene is good. And that's the bit we're going to assess them on. And if people haven't thought about that, they may get a bad score. So any training, any fault prior to the inspection is a good investment in that activity, for sure. And what, what kind of training would you recommend uh, a small beekeeper to, uh, to do? Would it be something like a level two food hygiene or are you looking for something a bit more sp specific? No, level two is more than enough, which is what most entry level people in the food industry have got. If they come along to a bee association meeting and they've uh, organized like uh, I'm doing one tomorrow with East Carmarthenshire, either like an hour with me talking about food safety is CPD. They can get a certificate off of me that can act as uh, professional development towards food safety training. Very difficult to get localized food safety B courses for sure. Mm. However, there will be generic online level two food hygiene courses you can take for 25 pounds on the internet. It's the basic, it's about hand washing, it's about disease control, it's about cross-contamination. It's not specific to the bee industry. You're gonna to have to cascade that knowledge to your industry. But if you're local and you're fortunate enough that the a trade association has organized a food safety event, then go along to it. Well, there you go. The food hygiene level two, that's an online course and about 25 pounds, is it? Yeah. So if you think about do that first before you contact the food inspectors. Always good, always good. <laughs> One step ahead. So someone's phoned you, Ian. You've arranged a visit. You're going to turn up on site. Talk me through roughly what are you looking for. So you, you, you're walking in, you, you meet, you meet the, the, the person who, who's been investigated or not investigated, but you know, inspected. In, inspected. You know, talk me through what, what are you looking for and talk me through what the visit may entail. For sure. And if we haven't had a, any intel on this company before, a lot of it's about classification. It's about who are you? What are you selling to? Is it just domestic? How big are you? How many hives you got? Where are the hives? Are they local or are they somehow apiary hives? We're trying to get an idea on the scale of your business. How much? Where are you going? Are you looking to expand? Are you just happy to be small? Are you doing uh, any other non-food products? Is there any other food like jams and chutneys you're also doing? So we're looking at the totality of that small business at their home. Who is it? Is it just a husband, husband and wife? Is there kids involved? Is there any other people involved in that food business? Or is it just the one man beekeeper and his dog that just happens to want to turn an amateur hobby into a bit more of a professional sales pitch? Some people we go to are very up and running. They've got business to business sales going on. They've got their labels produced. There's a lot going on already before the visit we do, which is good, you know. And for them, they need to think about, well, what types of records should I be keeping? What would the inspector expect to see? You know, from a, from their point of view, they should think about what's going to prove that what they do is safe. They can't just do it. They need to prove it's safe. Yeah. Hmm. Lot to think about. If it's easy when a, when a beekeeper wants to arrange a visit and you come out, you you arrange a date. Uh, that's that suits and they come out. Do you call out of the blue sometimes as part of your job? Is it is it like a, a, a do you do a spot check sometimes? I've just come from a visit today and that was unannounced. But that's a food manufacturer and they accept that we just call in unannounced. People at home would expect us to call them up because they're at home. It's their home. We can't just turn up because other things may be going on. Plus, we want them to be there and we want something to be happening. So for beekeepers, I want them to be extracting. If I just turn up on an ants, there's nothing to see. No. There's an empty room. So it would be seasonal. I'll be asking them how many times a year would they extract. It's probably only once a year for some people. And when is it? So I can actually be there when they're actually doing it. Or they can set up the equipment and show me what that day looks like. So I can ask them relevant questions like where would you wash your hands? How would you clean that equipment? Now you've got it out you know, the extractor, the clean. So I want to see it as close as possible to its real life working. It's not hypothetical. No, this is how they would have done it if I was leaning over their shoulder the day they spun that honey out. I want to see that. I want yeah. to see them. So if someone wanted to say... Uh, they, they've just set up a room and it's, it's spring but you know they, they want to get things going as long as they've set the kit out in the room yeah. you can come and they, they can talk the, the process with you and that would be adequate 30% of the assessment generally is on structure so seeing the room where they do it set up ready to go is very important 
30% is on the actual uh, food safety aspect, so if they've got any paperwork, training certificates, that's that's important to see. And the other 30% is actually on the operational day of the extract. Now, if we can't actually be there when they extract, they can at least talk us through it because we've got them in their environment and we can say, did you wash your hands today? Did you clean that surface? Did you exclude your pets? Because it's obvious if they haven't done that. Whereas it's not hypothetical, it's real if they're actually doing something. Mm. So yeah, we'd like to see it as close as possible to the real scenario. Yeah. Make, makes a lot of sense. And I suppose the, the next question to that is, how often do you visit beekeepers once they're uh, on, on the books as such? Good question. The vast majority of beekeepers are still what we call primary producers. They are low risk because of that. We don't classify them as a food premise. They're not risk rated on the same frequency as inspections as most what people would classify as food premises like takeaways, restaurants, cafes. So it could be every... 10 to 20 years for some wow. primary producers because they're not that high risk. Honey is not a high risk product. The actual production process is well maintained. There's not many non-compliances during a visit and we don't get many complaints. So based on that intelligence, why would we want to see them any quicker? We're happy with what they're doing and they can be doing that infinitum in the background with us inspecting higher risk premises mm. where we do get complaints and we do have food poisoning yeah. incidents. Of course. So that's where our time tends to be focused. But if they want to see us any quicker, just pick up the phone. Well, there you go. So chances is you may only <laughs> ever get one visit. But it's a different case <clears throat> when someone is set up like us and yes. they, they buy honey in and they pack honey, etc. Then it, it becomes a different kettle of fish. It's yes, you're right, Griff. <clears throat> Once you're rated as a food premise, and that is the vast minority is, is rated as a food premise, it then cycles around on a risk-rated basis. And that depends on how many customers you've got business to business, how big your scope is so if you're regional or national then we want to visit you more often because your impact's going to be greater it does depend on how complicated your process is so if you was doing a lot of organic or blending or heat extraction secondary extraction then yeah we want to visit you more often because your risk is higher but if it's just simple i spin it i extract it i put it in a jar that's quite slow risk still. So your frequency of inspectors could still be every five years. Still, is yeah. yeah. Well, there we go. That is uh, good news. Well worth it. Do the work, get inspected, and there's a, a good gap between visits. It's not like maybe I'm thinking maybe a kebab shop or something. Yes. High risk. You know, people get food poisoning people quite quite easy. You know, I, I suspect you, you visit those kinds of premises a, a, a lot more than yes. you would visit a, yeah. a, a bee farm or a beekeeper. Absolutely, you've got it. Yeah. So I've got a few questions here, Ian, about, I suppose, honey and the labels on the oh, jar. Always tricky. So what does the jar need to have for, for you to sell it legally? Well, a lot of it is in the honey regs that tell you what to communicate on the jar, like the origin, the name and address of the packer. And if it isn't in the honey regs, something called the food information regulations kick in and apply to all foods. And, and it says the durability date, the uh, conditions under which you should store it. Um, and any conditions on use would also be useful to consumer, tend to govern the labelling of honey. There's quite a lot of exemptions of honey, so you don't have to put a nutritional list in if you don't want to. Uh, you don't have to put instructions on use, but certain things are mandatory, like country of origin. And uh, what about uh, batch number? Yes, for traceability, we'd like to see some type of traceability, like the lot code or a batch number some people use the durability date and that helps for things like recall not everyone needs a recall because they're not doing business to business but it certainly is a starting point that if you've got a date on the jar or a unique batch number then we can trace it back to that day's production and what about um, a best before date is there a set period of how long you can give because obviously you know they, they found honey in the pyramids 3000 years ago and it was still safe to eat etc but you know whether you don't eat that honey is a different story but when it comes to realistically uh, to, to put a, a best before date on a jar this is one question that's come up how, how long should someone give a, a best before date on a jar or should, 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 should they use it at all well there's a lot of prescription on durability mainly on the use by um, the difference between use by and best before but honey will always be long life it'll only be 30 month, three months and over so the only distinction really would be best before end day month year or best before and i think with honey you're right it, it can easily last three years without going off 
it's the date to which the quality deteriorates. So different honeys will deteriorate over time in a different manner. So at that date, you think it's no longer of the quality. That's the end of its natural quality life. And different flowers and different blossoms have a different date. So it's quite tricky to be prescriptive. But you're quite right. Once sealed, it's quite a low pH, a low available water product. It doesn't, it doesn't go rancid, it doesn't oxidise that well, so it will last quite a long period in that jar, safely stored away from the heat and away from direct sunlight for a long period. So you could put quite a long life on it, and we wouldn't so have a problem with that. If someone would have put a two to three year after, after jarry, would, would, that, would yeah, that be fine? That'd be fine, yeah. Well, there you go. If you sold someone a jar of honey and they haven't eaten it in three years, <laughs> then you know maybe that's not a good customer. But, uh, <laughs> they wouldn't they, be older, though, would they? No. <laughs> so here, here's an interesting question, and here, here's another question that, that, that keeps coming up. Can you call honey pure honey? natural honey and raw honey raw is the, is the big one obviously we we used to use raw back in the day and um it was a, di- a different trading standards back back yeah. there at, at the and and we were told you've got to remove the raw which you know we did and we we haven't reused it you know what's what's the score with putting an extra word in front of the honey it is, it is an important question. We do get asked it quite a lot, and we don't make it up. There is a clear guide by the Food Standards Agency on clear food labelling, which we use as a guidance to us to advise your members. And the, the word pure and natural is almost not needed with honey because you can't add anything to honey. So all honey is a single ingredient. All honey is pure. Mm. So by suffixing it with the word pure or natural, you're trying to claim something that it isn't, in our opinion. So it's kind of misleading. So we don't tend to like people using those terms where it may be misleading to a material degree it's not being blended it's a single ingredient product the raw one very contentious there has been a guide by the british beekeepers association on when to use raw and not to use it and they hypothesize that it is linked to the process in the use of heat treatment in which case if you're doing something like a secondary extraction or applying some method of heat not to just pasteurize it but to get some remaining honey out of the foundation then and someone's not doing that then your honey is not as industrially produced as theirs you could argue that yours is as raw as the hunt that you know little bee produced in his little honey sack and you've just helped it out into your jar that's raw, whereas another industrially produced honey that's gone through all these processes of heat extraction isn't raw. So the use of the word raw is to distinguish between the industrial producer and the artisan home producer. And I wouldn't have a problem with that if it's true. Mm. I don't like seeing it where it's not true. Yeah. So more steps in your process. Ask yourself the question, if people can see all those steps, would they really think I've literally just taken it out of the hive and put it in a jar? Or would they be conscious that it's gone through quite a lot of steps before it's got into that jar? <laughs> I get you. So, uh, reading between the lines, it is okay to use the word raw, as long as that honey... I'm thinking of my own process, that, for example, the cut comb. Mm. You've, you've cut out the frame, it's in the... You know, no yeah, man has yeah. touched it, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I would class... Would, would that be okay to put raw... In front of a, a piece of cut corn being I, sold? I would, and again, I would base it on the BBKA guidance, and it's not just me making it up. We want consistency. Yeah. We don't want people just making it up. The The problem we've got with raw is not everyone agrees. And yeah. until everyone agrees, we haven't got consistency. So I could cite the BBKA guidance and say, well, I would find that acceptable, and I would. But someone else may disagree, like an industrial producer may disagree because yeah. they want to use the phrase and get that market cachet. Because that, that's, yeah. that's the, the, the big issue, really. You know, if you were to look at the, the honey we produce, the high 90-something percent of that honey is just spun out the frame. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's filtered, and, and, and that's it. A small amount of it then would be um, coming out the appy melter, which has had a bit of heat, but yeah. that is a, an industrial-built machine designed to separate the wax and the honey and not to damage the honey. You know, yeah, it's, it's a, it's yeah. a thousand pounds piece of equipment. So, I mean, would, <laughs> would, would, would that be raw? I mean, you know, and if, if something is raw, then the next question is, is, is from a few bee farmers. If, so, if I put a jar of honey there and I say it's raw, and then there's another jar of honey there and from another producer and that the they say it's raw, what test could we do? to analyze yes, the honey, uh, yes. to prove. Because <laughs> I, I think that is 
And the, the miss because you know, for, for someone uh, from the BBK say, well, you know that, that honey, uh, you know, you use an appy melter, you know, or maybe less than three percent of your honey has has, be, has been uh, brought through the appy melter. Well, if you can prove that the two honey on the H, HMF level, on 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 all yes. all, the, all the different yeah, levels yeah, that, yeah. That, that that they test on that it's still the same or yeah, it's within the yeah. parameters. Is that raw? And I mean, very good. I, I've, I've got yeah. no idea. You know, um, and and you're right. If we can't agree a standard, then how can I take it to my laboratory and say, please test against that standard? Because we only work to internationally agreed standards. So in a way, you're right. We can't differentiate between competing products if no one agrees on what the standard should look like. So we do need the industry to step forward and say, this is what we accept as raw, write it down, we'll specify it, and then can we test it? I'm sure the laboratories will come up with a suitable test on some of the grounds. Yeah, I, I, I would have thought, as, as long as people put out like this is the pra- this is what honey this is what the parameters of raw honey looks like yeah you know this is what the, the hmf needs to be between this yeah and you know we, we get that anyway with honey because when, when we test honey you know we, we when it comes back we we got to make sure that it's be- between these different parameters um maybe the, the the raw honey the parameters would be maybe a bit tighter i i don't know but as it is is it is a minefield really and we, we personally haven't gone back to using the word I mean I have been tempted especially talking to you now I, I have been tempted but I, but I don't know if it's we go back to that reason you said what's our role and our role is to ensure fair trade and in the name of the food in the name of that food we don't want people competing unfairly so uh, I would be happy if the industry agreed and we could all agree on what role honey was so genuine people could use it and those that shouldn't be using it, we can tell the, to take it off. Yeah, because uh, we'll just add one more thing, because I can't tell you how, how much this is this is coming up in the, in the comments. The, the the problem with raw is as well. You know, the Commander's Company Council at the time came down hard on it. Um, you know, two two big packages had, had a bit of a fight. One was based in Wales, one was based in England. That 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 stirred it all up, and customers, they, they on especially online, they look for raw honey so it's, it's a search term uh, that potential customers use yeah. to fight you know to, to buy honey now us being in Kamalisha we, we've not been able to capture that market because we, we've taken the, out the raw but then I look at other honeys on the market you know from other counties especially London based mm. and they're clearly got raw everywhere so it's almost an unfair market there really because different counties have taken yeah. a harder stance on, on the term. I know, I know it's not just Kamalas has taken it. I'm just using Kamalas because yeah. I live here. I know other companies that, that similar bee farmers have had the same issue where they've, they've removed the and word raw it, as well. Right. And I think it was in the day where we did a lot more inspections, we did a lot more enforcement work and minor, what would fall minor breaches of law were stamped out on because once you let one foot in the door, everyone decides to do it. So it is important to stop the first person doing it, mm. otherwise you get a cascade. And I'm not justifying the behaviour of the inspectors in the past, but that was the culture. And you know, maybe we've got less inspections, we've got less testing, we've got less um, reason to stop people doing it, and it's just proliferated again. You know, we've got yeah, okay. people are using it. it. Doesn't make it right. It just yeah. that's just where we are. <laughs> so just just for everybody watching. Reading between the lines, you can put raw on your label and you're not going to get in trouble. <laughs> if it's genuine. If it's genuine. There's still a grey area there. Um, but, you know, we've, we've come, you, you're the first guy I've spoken to where we've come this far with it, really. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, 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 you've it. given quite, quite yeah. a, 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 a strong answer on it, which, which oh, I think a lot, of, a lot of beekeepers yeah. would, would uh, be thankful for. Okay. So here's a nice one, weights and measures law. So do does a beekeeper, small or large, they need to buy in approved scales and do they need to weigh every single jar of honey or can they weigh a jar of honey up to a line and then just fill up to the line for the rest of the year? Right, Griff, there's several questions there. I would have to qualify it. I used to be a weights and measures inspector, but now I'm only paid as an environmental health officer. I will answer as a non-qualified weights and measures inspector. Uh, so certain foods have to be sold by weight or measure, and that's defined by a miscellaneous food order that dates back pre-joining the European Union. So there was always the case that once you place on the market as that food, 
then the Weights and Measures Act would then kick in and say, well, you have to sell it by weight, you can't guess. So if you use equipment to help you determine in the be it capacity or mass, then that piece of equipment should be approved for trade use. And the approval means that the equipment is passed as fit for use for trade, which means it's stamped. So you're not just using any old shop bought scales. No, no, it's passed the test. Mm -hmm. There's no uncertainty in the actual scales because you don't want to be added into that error by just using any old scales. So to answer the second part of your question, if it has to be sold by weight and measure and you buy a scales, then ideally that piece of weighing equipment should be a stamp scales, be it a UK lead plug or an EEC stamp, which are more expensive than the normal scales for sure. But as long as it's legally traceable either to the equipment or to a little mass weight that you put on, so we could trace it back to a known standard, then if you want to weigh your honey by capacity, so you just put it to the field line, most honey jars are measuring container bottles. They're built to a certain specification. So by filling it to that line, you are filling it to a capacity. So if you know that your jar isn't what we call an MCB, a measuring container bottle, you can actually do it by eye and check you filled it to that line at that density, you're gravimetrically deriving it from the volume because that volume in that jar is the known capacity for that jar. And there were a lot of honey jars in their day were the old panned, half panned, imperial panned. Yeah. And they still build them that way. <laughs> so a lot of honey packers out there that were buying jars off you or other companies will still get the old fashioned MCB jars and they'll all be measuring container bottles, which is good. Yeah. Because they could just fill it to the top and it will be. It'd be the perfect weight. Yeah. Yeah. Honey does vary in density, so they may not know the density. You can work out your density of your honey. Uh, but then in which case you may not have to weigh it because you've got that mechanism to know that you filled it to a known measure. If your jar isn't a measuring container bottle, then weighing it would be the best method of determining its nominal quantity, yes. Perfect. Okay, so I've got a question here. Is it essential to have running hot and cold water in your honey house or kitchen? Very good question, Griff. And the reason for hot water, and it has been scientifically proven, is just washing your hands in, in normal soap is more effective when the water is hot. So there's more kind of chemical and biological action that happens by default than just simply running cold water. And I know a lot of remote premises haven't got hot water, particularly to the place where they do the extraction. So having the hot water supply is an, an expense but it is defined for food premises, and I'll go back to are they a food premise or are they a primary producer, but for food premises, it does say in the regulations that determine the structure of the premise that hot and cold running water is a mandatory requirement. So there's no exemption for honey guys. Once they're a food premise, then you're going to be washing equipment as well. So obviously it's not just your hands you're washing, you're washing your equipment, and again, chemicals that are designed to work as disinfectants and detergents are better worked in hot water than cold water. So I'd say hot water does have its part to play in the food safety environment for a food premise. Now obviously as a primary producer, you are exempt from those requirements, but it's good practice to have hot and cold running water. Of course. Water. So if you can't get a hot water supply, you could you know, boil a flask, make it tepid. Bring a, a belco yeah. boil or something. So it's not unreasonable to get around the fact that you may not have a, 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 a running tapped supply. You can bring like mobile vans, have to do a bowl and a flask and wash your hands on yeah. utensils. Or just save the utensils until you take them back to the house and clean them at the sink where you have got a supply. So it's a workaround solution. So some people haven't got hot and cold running water but ideally I would look to see that they have, yeah. Well, there we go. So ideally you want hot and cold water, but the hot is not essential if you're primary producer, but ideally you want to have hot water there. And this leads, leads me to the, the second question from this person. Can a honey house be in a garden shed? I have seen them, uh, wooden structures, and I go back to the requirements of the structural requirements of food premise. So the minute they're not a food premise, I can't mandate the floors, walls and ceilings like I can if you're in a food premise. I can say that they're operating to good practice. So if I see a garden shed, I look at the walls and I say, are they smooth, washable and easy to clean? So if I'm looking at bare wood that hasn't been coated or hasn't been treated, then it goes back to, well, could it easily be cleaned? It's going to get dirty. Uh, extraction is mm. not uh, a clean task by any stretch of the imagination. So I'd like to see it clean a ball. Um, 
And in that so regard, a, a lick of lick of paint on this yeah, in, inside would, yeah. would make it okay for for someone small scale. Covering tables with just cloths, you know, cl cleanable cloths, you know, putting putting lino on floors rather than carpet. Carpet is very difficult to clean, so it's just about thinking. At, at the end of the day, they are going to clean that premise. And how difficult is it going to be if that's rough wood? Yeah, of course. And cloth carpets and yeah. So, yeah, I, I, in a way, almost outdoors would be best. Sir. No walls, no ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> Just on the floor. It's off the floor, the extractor, and as long as nothing touches the floor, I wouldn't have a problem with that. It's, it, you are eliminating risk, and structure is can be risky. Can help you. But it can be risky. So the garden shed analogy, yeah, is it's, it helping you? Or no, I mean, I suppose if, if if you come out and you see someone's dusty garden shed <laughs> and, and they say, and yeah, this not a good look. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> and th that that brings me on to the to the next question uh, quite nicely. Are there any specific guidance on the type of material that you look for when when you want uh, eat, wipe down cleanable? Material. It can it be a, a metal, a plastic, a, Maybe, pa a paint. No, uh, the, the law is very generic. Its its phrase is something along the lines of smooth wash but uneasy to clean, non corrosive. It mustn't react with the chemicals that you're cleaning with. And in that regards, it's not specific. It doesn't drill down and says you need a certain grade of stainless steel or a certain laminate of composite wood. But then you equally and oppositely know when a surface isn't smooth wash but uneasy to clean. Because when you are looking at bare wood. You just have to ask yourself, how would you clean it with yeah. this rough wood? You know, when you are looking at a cloth surface, like a carpet, it's it's very difficult to clean the carpet other than hoovering it. Yeah, of so course. So, by default, it's easier to define what isn't uh, a washable surface than to say, yeah. once you've got a surface, if it can be cleaned, this is tend to be obvious and it's cleanable. So basically, wood isn't the best choice of material to use in, in a honey house. You want to try and avoid that if you can. Most of the hives that you do see are wooden in nature, but they do vary in the grade of wood. But once it's out of the foundation into the extraction equipment, they do tend to be stainless steel. Now, some of the old ones are aluminium. And then once they're into the buckets, they do tend to be hard density plastics. And then into the glass jars, they do tend to be borosilicate glass. So by definition, a lot of the materials are clean or cleanable it's very di difficult to see where wood would come into that process but we sadly do see it on platforms that people rest the honey extractor on tend to be wooden blocks mm -hmm. or tables that people are putting their kind of i don't know their wax decanters on tend to be wooden some of them and you've got to take that in the, that's the structure where you're doing the extraction so you know it's still going to get dirty yeah and you still need to clean it so generally, think about what type of wood it is. Is it a hard wood, soft wood? Is it a laminated? Is it covered already with a with a surface that can be clean? So generally, try and avoid the raw, bare woods. Yeah. So something like a an OSB board or plywood and, and yeah. paint that would would be the the best grade of wood if wood was someone's if only budget or, or yeah. option. Yeah. Well, there we go. You know, you, you're very. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not relaxed, but you, 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 you're willing to help the beekeepers out as much as they can, especially when they start off and maybe they haven't got money to buy full grade plastic, stainless yes. steel. You know, you, you, you're willing to give people a chance as long as it's clean and you know they, you can, they can prove that it, they can clean it. That, that's, that's basically what you're looking for rather than yeah. a specific type of material. You've got to be practical because it's a one day of the year for some people, that's it. One day they're going to be extracting and that one day they may or may not use a piece of wood, you know, and you mm. have to be practical how much of it is wood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. So here's a, another question I've got from one of my uh, followers. So they're considering converting um, a building, a room inside a building into a honey house, yeah. but there's a lot of asbestos in that building. Mm. If they box everything up and seal the old asbestos boards everywhere, Maybe the roof is asbestos, and you know they, they seal up the room. Is that okay, or is that a big no from the start because there's a high volume of asbestos in the building? I don't know what type of grade of asbestos you get, blue and grey. Just generally, it's more of a health and safety from their point of view uh, a hazard because they're going to drill into it. Yeah. Any structure where you put a cocoon in, inside a building. So if he cocooned himself either into a corrugated shed or a wooden <laughs> shed. Inside, that's what we examine. So once you've cocooned yourself, we're looking at the cocoon. Right, okay. <laughs> Not the outer skin. Yeah, so, so basically, 
it's fine, but be very careful <laughs> when someone comes in to do that kind of work yes, that yeah, they're not being yeah. exposed to, to yeah. the asbestos. Yeah. There we go, perfect. Is there any guidance on what kind of ventilation does a honey house need to have? And I've got a question here, someone asking, is a, a brick vent okay, or should they use a, a finer grade mesh to seal any kind of openings uh, on, on any kind of ventilation that they, their building may have? Ah, well, I think as a food inspector, we would look at ventilation different to a beekeeper. Their ventilation is to keep out insects whilst you're extracting. What we would see is, is ventilation causing them a food safety issue? Is the condensation getting in? Does the building need to be ventilated? Are you heating anything? So generally speaking, you're not cooking. So you're not generating heat that needs to be taken out of that structure. So ventilation is less critical, I'd say, for a honey extraction room than if you're actually cooking in that room and heat is being generated and it's going to condensate on the walls and the ceiling. So in that regard, ventilation is just natural. And if a brick serves the job, then so be it. Obviously, if it doesn't let wasps and other insects in at the same mm. time, I haven't got a problem with the method of ventilation. It's whether it's going to cause a hazard. And generally speaking, extraction rooms are not a ventilation hazard. Someone's on extraction and if they're, they're happy with the room, what kind of clothes should they wear as a, as a base minimum to, to be able to extract their honey safely? If they've got a beard, if they've got long hair, is, is clothes like this okay? What, 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 what kind of PPE should, should people be wearing in the honey house? It's a good question, Griff. And as you well know, there's a lot of television programs where people will be in food factories and you'll see that snoods and mop hats and white coats. And we do associate those with food premises, in particular food manufacturing premises, where we're trying to reduce or eliminate the risk of the human being the risk to the food process. And they tend to be factories where people are standing there all the time doing something in front of open, high-risk foods. So those PPE precautions, gloves, schnoods, hats, are proportionate to that risk because someone will be eight hours a day making a sandwich, leaning over that sandwich. So that clothing would be representative of controlling their risk. People that are extracting honey are doing several things. They're bringing in foundation from the outside, they're maybe a couple of hours on the extractor, and then they may move on to settling it, maybe a day's gap. So you could argue once it's out of the foundation into the conditioning unit or the extraction unit, it's kind of safe because it's a sealed environment. Does your clothing really add to that? Are these things are going to fall off you into that vessel because it generally has a lid. So we're just trying to prevent any physical cross-contamination from you. That's what PPE is trying to do. And we don't want people walking in with their civvy clothes and they've just been mucking out the pigs mm, or they've course. been stroking the dog and they've all got hairs. We're trying to prevent that risk of them to the process. So it is helpful if they do decant and put you know, a different jacket on, but it's not essential. It depends what they're doing and how their task is proportionate to that risk. So if a lot of their process is sealed, then are they going to add to that risk? It goes with the philosophy of good hygiene practice. Would they walk in to a honey extraction room and not wash their hands? You know, or would they not change their clothes? Because if you are got dirty clothes, you would think naturally that you'd want to cover your clothes, wouldn't you? Yeah, of course. So, so, so basically, again, it's the, it's the same um, topic over and over. If you're clean, your clothes are clean, yeah. you wash your hands, yeah. I mean, that is the bare minimum of, of extracting honey, really. And, and if you want to improve that, you could put a, put a hairnet on so, so no hair comes out. And yes. It, yeah. you know, the, it's up to you how, how much more that you want to go. And it looks good, particularly if you're doing a public display like you sometimes do to the public. It looks always more professional because you've considered that risk. Mm. Whether there's a theoretical risk, but it's it's just the perception that you're paying attention to small detail because you don't wouldn't really want a little hair in your jar. No, and that's why I do wear a hairnet because <laughs> I always think you know it's not going to contaminate the hen in the honey in any other way. But how embarrassing would that be? You know, you sold a jar of honey and they open it up and there's a hair in it. Yeah. You know, that's so I, I take that very serious because I know what it feels like when you <laughs> get a meal from when there's hair in it. You know, this, that's, the last, that's the last thing you want to do is have your hair in your honey. So <laughs> cover your head. That's coming from me. So but basically, you've got to be clean. That's, that's the biggest advice um, yeah. you, you can give everybody. And here's, here's the last question I've got from, from one, uh, one of our members is, is it okay to use another beekeeper's honey house and is it okay to rent your own honey house out to other beekeepers what are the issues or risks involved 
into an act. Interesting question, and we do get this in other food premises, like we go to a church hall and it'd be used by multiple food businesses, or we'll go to a community parish hall and three or four people will be registered there. So clearly it happens within the food sector. And all we say is between uses, that next person has to be mindful of what the last person did. Mm. <laughs> you know, they may not be as clean as you. So if I was renting my honey house out, or I was the person renting it out, I'd be wanting to put some conditions on, well, if they use it, I don't want them damaging my equipment, my structure, my hygiene. You know, I don't want them bringing in any chemicals that are going to be corrosive or doing anything that's harmful to my equipment. So I'd be writing that fundamentally into the contract. Yeah, you can use it, but just be careful of, of how you do it or use my cleaning chemicals, operate to my cleaning standards because it's my premise. And if I was the person leasing it or being a rentee, I would have to be mindful of what conditions they wanted me to rent it under. So it's not impractical to do that because we used to hire out equipment at clubs, we used to hire out the extractor, it's going to go from hand to hand. Yeah. But yeah, clean it after use, so you give it to the next person clean. Yeah, so basically <laughs> that's, that's the thing, even if you're uh, renting a room and you go then it's clean, yeah. maybe give that a quick light wash just so you physically know yourself, yeah. your own records and, and notes that everything was perfectly clean when, when you use it. So exactly. there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with borrowing extractors, using another person's honey room, letting your friend use your own honey extracting room. That's, that's perfectly fine. It is, and it will happen, for sure. There you go. Right, this is the last question here, and I'm wary of your time. Now that we've left the EU, uh, what, what effect is that gonna have on the honey regs in the UK? Because before, we follow the, the European guidelines of, of honey. The Europe are now changing their honey regulations. They, they're gonna get rid of the word a blend, which I'm pretty sure everybody watching the channel is, uh, is in agreement that is a really good thing. Is that gonna happen in the UK or are they not gonna bring that in because we, we're following different parameters of rules now? It's a very good question and it is an ongoing concern to a lot of food businesses, not just honey packers. So honey regulations is a directive. I think it's 110 stroke 10 is the directive. And then when we left the European Union, that directive was parked and we didn't amend our domestic legislation since. So if the European Union have developed it, we haven't. We ambulated it into UK law through the honey regulations in Wales. And that's what brings that old directive into play. We left um, the EU law on the 31st of December 2023 officially and we've had to assimilate those former directives across because we're still working to them. If you don't export your honey then there's no odds because you don't have to produce it to these new European standards like you've mentioned about the blending because we're just under domestic law and that's where we've been since we left the European Union. You have to be mindful that we'll be importing honey and if we don't produce our own honey regs, people could import honey to whatever standard they like. So you may be unfairly competing with people that are not operating to any standards because there is no base standard anymore in sugar levels, in labeling, in hygiene or bits of foreign bodies because we haven't brought in a new honey regs. So having a honey regs does set an even playing field and it would be incumbent on the government now we've left the European Union if they think honey is an important industry is to bring in a new honey regs that defines what it means to domestic honey producers now they could rewrite it they could just leave it as it is but update it but just doing nothing is going to create an uneven playing field in my opinion uh, and even if you're a domestic honey producer that didn't export and you weren't afraid about importing because you just sell it locally it may mean that eventually people can undercut you in in your market because they can whip away your competition at a reduced price because they're not operating to any particular standards that you feel that you had historically worked to because in the honey regs there is some compositional standards on sugar levels and on what contaminants look like and what floral names of honeys that should be Mm. So they're important to people. They set a baseline in the market and they stop people unfairly competing. If you remove those, then people will eventually unfairly compete. Yeah, so we're, we're in a bit of a limbo then. It, it, it could be a good thing if, if they decide to strengthen the regs mm -hmm. or it could be a really bad thing if, it, if they decide not to Remove do it, anything. Yes, yes. <laughs> so time will tell uh, the way that will go. But I'm sure as beekeepers, uh, especially the BBK, we put 
good amount of pressure on the authorities where it's needed to, to protect beekeeping as an industry and the honey we produce in the UK. But I just want to say for everybody on the channel, Ian, thank you very much for coming on the channel and agreeing to do this. I'm sure uh, the, the, the audience, they've had a vast amount of information there that's going to really help them develop their maybe beekeeping sideline business or hobby or for the ones that want to you know, maybe become a more, bit more like us and, and do it full time you answered some valuable questions and i don't think there's a, a single video out there on youtube that has covered the information you've given it today so Ian, thank you very much griff pleasure mate and if everyone was like you my job would be a breeze well, well there we go i don't know about that but uh, thank you very much Ian, and we'll see you at the next video